Hi, this is Moby, and welcome to episode three of Moby Pod with me and Lindsay and Bagel. And today we are going to celebrate the release of the punk rock vegan movie and talk about punk rock and animal rights and veganism. And Lindsay, I believe we are even going to have a guest. It's that, true. Okay. Yeah. Can We're, you tell us about our guest? I would love to. Our guest today is Derek Green, who we're both really excited to have. He features in punk rock vegan movie. He's a lead singer of the band Sepultura. He's also an amazing animal rights activist and the co-host of a show called Highway to Health and just a generally great human being. So why don't we go and do a little interview with Derek? We just finished having lunch outside with our friend Derek from Sepultura, and we're now going to try and have a conversation outside with one qualifying caveat. We are outside in Los Angeles, which is the second largest city in the United States. Not surprisingly, it's noisy. And we want to talk about all sorts of things, especially like veganism, punk rock, metal, touring, highway to health. but. While we were doing our sound check, I, as the engineer, was inside listening to your guys' conversation. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and you were talking about Stuff. voiceover. Cause I'm, yes. So the, when the pandemic started, when you had your fancy gentleman's gray mustache. Yes, I did. Not. The handlebar <laughs> gray mustache. I got a lot of comments like a Danny Glover, Uncle Phil. These are all <laughs> characters. Um, That's really funny. Favorite. TV well, shows and movies. You as a, as a, what? How tall are you? Like six, seven I'm six foot three. three. I'm six three. Okay. Well, you seem taller, especially it's my shoes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like the contrast between you as someone to have a vegan lunch with, or when I interviewed you for the punk rock vegan movie, like you're so thoughtful and introspective and culturally aware, and then you see video of you on stage, <laughs> and you are a gigantic monster person. Yes. It's one of my favorite aspects of the punk rock vegan movie is like everybody I interviewed was very thoughtful Mm -hmm. and very quiet. And then like Rob Zombie or Ian MacKay or HR or John Joseph, then you, or you, Mm -hmm. like then you cut to these footage or images of these people on stage and they're the craziest performers who've ever existed. So I'm just pointing that out. That's not even really a question. I'm just self-involved person <laughs> no, rambling on. I think on. it's I... beautiful. Every human contains multitudes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think it's something that happens naturally with the combination of people that you're with. Mm-hmm. I've been in the process of writing these songs and then that energy from being in front of a live audience clicks together and it's something very unique and special. And after seeing a show at the age of 14, seeing Bad Brains play, I knew this is exactly what I want to do with music. Wow. This style of music, seeing people react to the music in that way was something very new and I, I had never seen before, where it physically move people, you know, yeah. to, to jump and to jump off the stage and be free. It reminded me a lot of the whole gospel scene mm-hmm. of like people praising, you know, like feeling this energy so much like, oh my God, oh Lord Jesus, let me stand yeah. up and start yeah. dancing around. I was like, yeah, Get this reminds me of like some old school yeah. like gospel, but in a hardcore way. Mm-hmm. Um, I would very much like to come back, but I still okay. want to. I want to do voiceover stuff for a second. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, do you have? Because I was very impressed when I saw the social media posts of, that you were doing your sort of voiceover <laughs> right. work. Oh yeah. So, do you have any voices that you feel like you can really inhabit that you feel comfortable sharing with us and our listening public? Well, I do have a voice <gasps> that's very low and deep, like this. It's like a gravelly voice, it's so and good. it's very like a uh, Barry White, mm-hmm. "Show You Right" type of voice. And can you, Orson Wells. There's a okay. real let's, market for that one. I let's believe think so. Because yeah. <laughs> that's also a good like sort of intro to an action movie disaster. Mm-hmm. Yep, like, it's the same. Like, maybe say something, what if the current world is the disaster and you're like, in a world where people eat innocent animals raised in sad cages. <laughs> in a world where innocent animals are eaten by people. 
These animals need to escape or their fate is sealed. <laughs> okay, Perfect. I would yeah. watch it. I would so, go ticket bot. <laughs> in a world okay. gone mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just wanted to hear that. Yeah, like I think Those the voice I can do. Stuff. I can also do kind of like a New York accent, yeah, that's but that's really like over the top, you know, at times. And I know with Tanya, I've done an Irish accent and. And, mm. and that's difficult. It's scary. It goes back and forth from like Jamaican to Irish and then like a pirate. So Pirish. <laughs> it's like sometimes they're talking that way and then I don't understand what you're saying at times. I don't know if it's a good one. Hardest one is definitely Scottish. Because then I that's, 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 that's the only but that's the only thing I can do. Really? Can Let do me it. think. Now I'm ashamed. Uh, <laughs> so the, the thing is, so my gran is Scottish. <gasps> and so I grew up hearing a lot of Scottish. <gasps> and my gran was just a wee little person. Impressive. Oh, it's That's really my good. It's in my jeans, Lindsay. <laughs> it's in my jeans. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. The Outlander like fan girls really, are going to go I normally bonkers. don't do a Scottish accent because I'm ashamed to do anything, basically, in public. But <laughs> it's the only accent I think I can actually get away with. <gasps> Impressive. That's really good. I that's like that. really, really good. I'm going to go hide in the basement one. for the next year. No, this year. is, like, my favorite thing that's happened I, in the last, like, nine mm-hmm. days. So. That was good. <laughs> okay, so going back to what you were talking about, was so your first exposure to punk rock, was it that Bad Brain show? It was either that Bad Brain show or a Cromax show, actually. Um, I was definitely 14 years old, but I think they were playing back-to-back the same week. Uh, it was the Eye Against Eye tour, and there was the Age of Coral tour. Age of Coral being the Cromags album, yeah. and Eye Against Eye Bad Brain. And were you living in New York at the time? I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, in where Cleveland. I grew up. I, I grew up in actually a place called Shaker Heights. Mm-hmm. My mother wanted to move there from Cleveland. My mother was a music teacher, and she felt that things were changing, and she knew that moving to Shaker, you'd be able to go to the public schools there. And the public schools were... One of the best in the country. I mean, I was seven or eight when we moved there. I had, I'd never seen a white person before or had friends. And my whole neighborhood was black where I lived in Cleveland. And then moving there was a whole different experience, a whole different world. But uh, we had the opportunity to choose whether to go to public school or to go to private school. And so <laughs> uh, my brother and sister ended up going to private school. And I went to Shaker Heights. And I didn't realize that. This place was very unique. I mean, I thought every school had a planetarium. We had a planetarium, <laughs> let alone, uh, you know, an Olympic-sized swimming pool. You're like, pool. every school has massage like every, therapists. Yeah. 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 Every school has these yeah. things. And, of course, traveling outside of my school area, I realized I was sorely mistaken where people had no idea what a planetarium was, let alone be able to pronounce it. But mm-hmm. it was unbelievable experience. You know, my teacher... For example, British Lit, she was from England, you know, Mrs. Hazley, mm-hmm. and she was teaching British Lit there. Then we had a teacher from Cuba teaching Spanish. I mean, it was an amazing school. It sounds amazing. And Paul Newman was an alumni of my school and wow. some other people in the comedy world. How, so, completely yeah. random sort of self-involved mm-hmm. question. How far away is Cleveland from Akron? 30 minutes, 35 minutes, yeah. Because my introduction to the world of punk rock veganism happened in Akron. Of all places, wow. Home of LeBron James. (laughs) And and Devo. (laughs) And Devo. And Um, the Pretenders. So More or less. Okay, So quick aside about like, because I just think it's interesting that so I was introduced to punk rock veganism 30 minutes away from where you were, even though I was from Connecticut. So in 1982, my hardcore band, the Vatican Commandos, went on tour with three other... Connecticut band, CIA, Reflex from Pain, and 76% Uncertain. Love 76% Uncertain. Oh, you know them? Yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) And our tour consisted of getting in a van, driving to Akron, playing a show in a pizza parlor for five people, and then driving back to Connecticut. So (laughs) when we arrived in Akron, we were staying in a vegan squat. Wow. And I remember waking up that Saturday morning on the floor after going to sleep at five in the morning, and there was some blue-haired punk rocker saying, hey, welcome to such and such vegan squat. I made lentils. And I was a 15-year-old kid from the suburbs, and I was like, I didn't know what a lentil was. I'd mm-hmm. never, I'd heard of vegetarianism. I didn't know what vegan was. Right. But that was my introduction to veganism. The irony there is my friend Jeff and I rejected the lentils, and we walked around the corner and went to a McDonald's, and Aww. I got food poisoning and Aww. was having all sorts of terrible things happening on the ride back to Connecticut from Akron. Thanks, so, McDonald's. Karma. So our exposure <laughs> to punk rock and veganism <laughs> happened... Right around the corner from each other. 
That's hilarious. Wow. That's it's a small world. And my I ended up going to Connecticut and because my sister ended up going to university there, Wesleyan University. Mm -hmm. And so I remember going to Littletown, Connecticut. Yep. So that was my Connecticut experience around that time. <laughs> and you, said, you said your mom is a, was a music teacher? Correct. I mean, you must have had a very musical oh, house. Yeah, was I she mean, teaching you from when you were little? She tried, you know, <laughs> especially piano. And, yeah. and we had a piano in the house, but I didn't realize how fortunate we were to have that opportunity. Music teacher, piano in the house, yeah. ready to go. She could play gospel because wow. she played at church and she played classical. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things I kept hearing back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. Classical, gospel, mm -hmm. classical, gospel. And then, of course, the follow-on question to that is, if your mom comes from the world of gospel and classical, has she is she still alive? No. Okay. But she was straight edge. Really? <laughs> really. Like actually like X on the back of the hand, straight edge? It, she could be, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Like no swearing, <laughs> no liquor, no she, smoking. Did she ever have the opportunity to see you perform in your punk rock and or metal self? Yes. <laughs> and, and at first she didn't really understand. I mean, we were practicing with my hardcore band in their basement, my parents' basement. So they were okay with that. Uh, just some of the neighbors, like, just let us know. Like, these are the mm -hmm. hours that are good. But everyone was really supportive, which Aww. helped tremendously. Um, she didn't really fully understand until going to the show where they were both, my mother and father, were standing in front of the stage before we were getting ready to play a simple tour. <laughs> and so they're standing there, and then some of the people in the audience are like, oh, you guys here for the show? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, our son is playing. And they're like, you probably want to step back a little yeah. bit. It's going to yeah. be a little crazy. And they're just like, oh, okay. And But uh, afterwards, my mother was really proud of me. I mean, mm. I remember I was traveling and she wrote me a letter explaining how she could definitely understand now seeing the reaction of people and how they loved it mm -hmm. and, and what we were doing. So that was really good to hear. That's so beautiful you know, yeah. that you got that. The similarities, because my hardcore band, we used to rehearse in my mom's basement. <laughs> right. Same thing. One time one of the neighbors came over with a gun because he was <laughs> drunk and we were making too much noise too late at night. Um, Bill Seberg, poor Bill. It's a little excessive. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, Bill, just ask us to turn it down. Like, you don't need to wave a gun around. To shoot somebody. What my mom would do, because we would practice so loud, right. is we had a tiny little like eight-inch black and white TV, and she had a little earpiece, and she would plug it into the TV so she could watch TV upstairs while we rehearsed because it was too loud oh, otherwise. Man. But it is kind of amazing. I don't know. Just that, that it, it made me realize how unique and special it is to have parents who wanted us to rehearse in the basement, right. who wanted mm -hmm. us to play music, who, who were excited. Like, I don't know about you, but I almost feel a little bit of guilt because I know so many people grow up in households where, like, their parents are very unsupportive of anything oh, they try to do musically yeah. or artistically. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, it, I remember even an album, DRI, mm -hmm. and one of their tracks, and it sounded like one of their fathers, like, you guys are making too goddamn much noise. Like, turn yeah. it down. Yeah. And, you know, most parents were like that, but... Actually, the people I played with, their parents were very supportive, even though they didn't understand the music or what was going on, but just that we were there, you know, in the yeah. house, mm -hmm. safe, you know, and not out doing like crazy stuff. And yeah. so. And I have a feeling, I don't know if your parents had the same thoughts. I assume so, because like, I think that my mom and my friend's parents were like, oh, these are good kids. Yeah. We, we were like, we didn't drink. We didn't right. do drugs. We right. didn't ha really have friends. <laughs> we didn't <laughs> like, it's like, oh, like these are nerdy, good kids. Absolutely. Like, we were definitely nerds and we were all the above. No drinking, no smoke, like nothing. You know? Yeah. Really just skateboarding and playing music and going to shows. And so we fast forward, or so it's you're 14, and mm -hmm. you see either the Cro Mags or the Bad Brains, mm -hmm. and it's your Saul on the road to Damascus moment. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they even had books at the show, yeah. the Cro, Cro Mags show. I remember they had the the Gita. There were books about vegetarianism, and that's when it kind of like sparked. Like these guys look insane on stage, like really good shape mm -hmm. and just. A lot of energy, and at the same time, I was meeting friends from New York who were working in health food stores that were vegan or vegetarians. A lot of the guys from Yuta Today mm -hmm. or Gorilla Biscuits, and um, they were working in this store called Piranha. I don't know if you remember that yeah, place. Yeah, Piranha is... 
I actually just did an interview with a Canadian radio station yesterday, and I was like, Prana was ground zero for punk rock veganism. Prana? Ev- Prana. Yeah. It was on First Avenue between 7th and 8th in New York, and it was old. I mean, like, when you think of a sad, old, dusty, hippie health food store, exactly it's this place. It. Like, the anemic cat asleep I on the brewer's yeast. smell it. You know, yeah. it's like the smell is coming back to me. I shopped there constantly, and everybody, I feel like Ray Oops. might have worked at Integral Yoga, but everybody else from like Walter, Walter Arthur, Sergio, I feel like Purcell, either worked there, shopped John, there. Yeah, even. every so it was like this in Angelica's Kitchen, but Angelica's Kitchen we couldn't afford to go to. Yes. So in the late 80s. So everyone shopped at Prana. Everyone went yeah. to Prana. Which means life-giving force. Yes, Or it does. breathing. Yep. Did you just look that up? I did on the internet. <laughs> I Googled it just now. But yeah, that, it's funny how <laughs> when we were doing the, all the interviews for Punk Rock Vegan Movie, the recurring thing was prana. Yeah. First, I mean, sure. obviously not for some of the younger people in the movie because it closed in like 92, no, maybe 94, 95. Mm-hmm. But like everybody from Rob Zombie, everybody oh, wow. went through prana at right. some point, like either a customer or you worked there. And I hadn't even thought about it in years because when you're growing up, it's funny because growing up being a vegan meant going to these weird old dusty hippie health food stores <laughs> and eating in weird old dusty hippie vegan restaurants yeah. or mm-hmm. vegetarian restaurants. So you're just like, that's that's veganism. And now, to state the obvious, it's so shiny. Yeah. Like you go to like shiny health food stores and it's go to shiny chic. vegan restaurants mm-hmm. and it's great, but it's like – it's just so different from what it was oh, yeah. when we were I mean, when we were young people. Radically different. I mean, there was no deodorant or anything. You just walked <laughs> in. There was all sorts of smells hitting you. You yeah. know, whether it be spices or bo. There's that, that yeah. sweet, unique smell of <laughs> vegan 1980s bo. It's like, well, I live in a squat. I bathe yeah. every two weeks. I smell kind of like brewer's yeast and fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you see the bad brains or cro right and you see the vegetarianism right but that but then- was my first like experience like thinking about it because i had an uncle that would come to the house and he was my mother's brother and he would always come with his own food and he was the first vegan that i knew like he i was wow. just like what are these grains and stuff and i was like hmm, these smell really good you know like different from what I was used to Mm -hmm. but I was always curious about it but I never really got into it with him but he was a vegan for his I mean a large part of his life you know all the way Mm -hmm. so that was the first experience seeing that and then also hearing about it with like Dick Gregory yeah was Dick Gregory was a legendary comedian Mm. and a phenomenally outspoken animal rights actors vegan he has one of my favorite (laughs) vegan quotes I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and I hope I don't offend anyone who's listening, but his quote is basically, it's really hard for me to hear you talk about justice when you have a stomach full of dead animals. Wow. <laughs> he was like, pulled no punches. Mm-hmm. That's Bagel likes that too. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Bagel, take it down a notch. So, <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, going forward, yeah, I was like, wow, what are these books involving spirituality mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. veganism and the understanding of like animals and that they have a life force as well and i was like i never thought about this you know and it was an avid reader as well like i love books and um i i I just dove right into it and i was like wow i really want to try this and see if it's for real Mm -hmm. this whole veganism it's so open-minded like it and i it makes (laughs) i'm kind of ashamed to say like when i first heard about vegetarianism and veganism I was sort of dismissive of it. Oh no, I was no! Like, I was like, "This is this is bullshit." I yeah. want to try it to prove it wrong. Because I loved. Because <laughs> like I, I was like, was I don't believe it. A teenager, real. I loved McDonald's. Oh yeah, I, I loved pepperoni pizza. I loved Steakums. So like, oh, my my God, conversion steakums. to veganism was like, Jeez. I really didn't want to give up going to McDonald's and Burger King. So I'm, I'm kind of amazed that you were that sort of like rational and open-minded. I was. I mean, I just wanted to prove it wrong, though. I was just like, I don't think it's going to make any difference. You're like, this isn't going to work. Yeah, I was like, let me try it, though, so I can at least Mm -hmm. confirm it 100%. And then I started that journey, and it was. I was pretty sick the first few weeks, really craving it. Yeah. You know, like, just like, oh, my God. And how old were you at this point? uh, 15. Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Again, I'm kind of ashamed. Like, at 15, I had, I, I was 
dismissing and ridiculing vegetarianism, <laughs> but I wasn't going to experiment with it. I was oh, like, I'm right. going to experiment eating more Burger King. I'm going to experiment eating more what? bacon and sausage. Well, also, that's an age where, like, fitting in was a big deal. And to, to do something that is so different from the norm, from your whatever group that you're in, True. I think it's scary to a lot of people, even, even I, now. It's hard to say, I want to do something different than what everyone does. I, absolutely. I mean, but when you feel different already, then it just seems normal in a yeah. way because I mean it was pretty different my parents like I said didn't drink or smoke they were uh, avid Christians going to church every Sunday my mm -hmm. mother teaching Sunday school singing in the church playing in the church not really uh, pushing it so much on me, but I had to go to church every Sunday mm -hmm. up until a certain age where like, you can go or not. And I was like, I'm not going anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm free. I'm free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the only thing I really loved about church was the part where we had a full band playing. And yeah. I was like, oh, here we go. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, man, the bass players is so amazing with yeah. the drummer. I mean, the rhythm section, gospel drummers are just yeah. the best. They're the best. Uh, just because they're playing with so much feeling and mm -hmm. the spirit of the Holy Ghost in them, it feels. And whatever works for them, it was working. But uh, I definitely felt on the outside because a lot of my friends' parents, they would come home and their parents would be hammered, you know, or, or yeah. they would be getting hammered on the way. Like, ah, oh, hard day at work, like whiskey or a cup of mm -hmm. something. And, and then they would just be talking about it. Like, oh, my parents were wasted last night or whatever or... And I would just see them and, and just, you know, that wasn't my world. It was yeah. radically different. So you were already feeling like I can make whatever choices I want because I'm seeing my parents defy the societal norms. Absolutely. And being that my parents were totally different as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, my father grew up in the South, grew up in Georgia, and my mother grew up in the North. And my father grew up in a time during segregation existed. Mm -hmm. So it was like white water fountain, black water fountain. Ugh. You know, it was so different from my mother who went to school, went to university. Mm -hmm. My father was like working in a field, you know, nine brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. My mother had one brother, the vegan, you know, mm -hmm. and she and they both went to university, graduated and were able to maybe move on to stuff but my father and mother met in church that was their connection hmm. you know even though they were from completely different worlds they had that in common and that's what like really drew them together but my mother was always like you got to go to school got to have an education the same with my grandmother who grew up in the north my father ended up being an electrician. I don't know, he had a mind for that. After like moving from the South and working his way up North, he was an incredible electrician, but that his brain just was geared to that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was, they're very unique individuals and seeing all the people around me, I was like, wow, they're very different. I, my brother and sister are different as well. And being able to have that freedom, you know, yeah. but they were very set in their ways, but they weren't pushing, you know, like really, you know, pushing us to be that. Mm -hmm. They want us to be our own individuals, to make That's our amazing. own decisions. We have talked a lot about like music in general, but I want to talk specifically about Sepultura and like mm -hmm. how you found your way to them and what the story is with that mm -hmm. band and how you work within the band and all of that. Mm, okay. I will add on to that. If you remember, like in the early to mid 80s, punk rock and metal were like basically like Judaism and Islam. Like yeah. they were so far apart. And then, like you mentioned, DRI. Yes, the crossover and phase. Metallica covered a Killing Joke song yeah. and a Misfit oh, song. So it started really to be like a little bit in an anthrax. There were some like yeah. bands where it started to hybridize metal and hardcore. That's all I'm going to say. Right. So, because because you are coming largely from the hardcore background, mm -hmm. and Sepultura are known for being a metal band. Right. But I remember the first time I heard them, I was like, "Wow, this is so fast!" Like yeah. it's like clearly they've listened to some hardcore records. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Okay. Oh yeah. Why do I talk so much, Lindsay? What's my <laughs> problem, Mike? Like, okay, I'm just going to shut up. Me and Bagel are just going to go sit and listen. No. <laughs> well, the Cliff Note version of it. I was living in New York working in bars and clubs in the East Village. And, what year? Uh, 95, 96. Okay. What, were you what? bartending? Were you? I was the bouncer cool. or the, Where? the doorman. Where did you work? I worked at Notel Motel. Mm -hmm. I worked at Babyland. I worked at Beauty Bar. 
And then at daytime, I had a job working at Fat Farm, working at Russell Simmons mm -hmm. clothing store. That's where I the met. The one in Soho? In Soho on mm -hmm. Prince Street. And I also worked at Match on Mercer Street oh, yeah. in the restaurant there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one, of my, one of my first ever DJ jobs in New York in was at Lucky there. Strike. Yes. Oh, right yeah. Right the corner from there. The spot. Um, they paid me literally in spaghetti. I didn't get paid money. <laughs> oh, they have great spaghetti. I got like I didn't get money. I would DJ <laughs> for like three or four hours, and they would give me a free bowl of pasta. Oh, lucky That's strike. adorable. Jeez, yeah. that was the spot to go to. And Beauty Bar. I used to live on 14th and 3rd, so Beauty ah, Bar was right around the corner. The yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm just trying to provide a little okay. bit of context. So it's 1995. You're in uh, New York. I, I, yeah, I was in New York, but in 97? Yeah, that's when a friend of mine was an A&R person. He'd gone to a lot of different shows. His name is Mike Gitter. And he ended up working at a label called Roadrunner Records. Mm -hmm. He had seen my previous band, um, hardcore band from Cleveland, and he knew about me just from going to shows, and I would see him there. And he came to me and he was like, hey, there's this band, Sepultura, their singer has left, and they're looking for a new singer. The old singer was Max, right? Correct. And is, I don't know anything about him leaving. Okay. I don't know. If that, is that something we're allowed to mention? Is that a yeah, bad thing? Or no, no. Okay I mean, thing? it's well known. I mean, it's it's been talked about over and over. And, okay. So, I, so I, he decided to leave. And so he, the band wanted to stay together and they had a tape going around tape literally of uh, one song that they had written not an old song a new song with no vocals on it mm -hmm. and they were giving it to people all mm -hmm. around the world like you can do whatever you want with it your vocals you can put over it your lyrics and make up something to this song so i got a ver i got a tape of this and he was like you should really try to do something they need a singer that's radically different so i got a tape and i heard the song and I decided I was going to do this. I was like, wow, I, I know the band. I'm not fanatical about them, but I know two of their albums. And they're pretty heavy, um, pretty intense. But they're different from typical metal band. Mm -hmm. They have different rhythms coming from Brazil and everything, their whole background. So I, I sent them a tape of me doing vocals. And then I heard back from them. And they're like, hey, you should come to Brazil and do an audition. And come down for two weeks. So they flew me down. I didn't know them. I didn't know how to speak Portuguese. I didn't know they spoke Portuguese in Brazil. I had to go to the library because there was no computers then, really, and I had to use my library card and find books about Brazil. There weren't too many books about Brazil, just about South America. I mean, that's a very <laughs> traditional heavy metal story. It's like going to the library with your library card to research the culture of the band you're auditioning for. I've never been there before. Isn't that where all heavy metal stories start? <laughs> yeah, using a library with a card. a library card. My library card. I mean, yeah. it was it was no, you know, I'm just going to Google it. I mean, it didn't even exist. I was just Google like, literally did not exist at yeah, that point. Yeah, I was just like, what is going on? Why aren't there enough books about Brazil specifically? It's about South America in mm -hmm. general. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. Went there, met them for the first time. Uh, the first week was just kind of hanging out with them, getting to know them and their family because they were all very connected with their family and their friends. And so I'd go to like football games, go to the beach. When I say football, and I mean soccer. And this was the auditioning yeah. phase? Yeah. So they're partying. Wow, okay. It was just like a party. Yeah. yeah. Woo, this is great. Getting to know them. And, and then the week after, like, okay, now we're going to go to the studio and we're going to jam. And I was like, all right. Very nervous, just for the fact that I had a full week of seeing them in their element mm -hmm. in Brazil, where everybody knew them. You know, they were just like super celebrities. Yeah. It, is, it is worth just Lindsay contextualizing a little bit. Sepultura are a huge band everywhere, but in Brazil, it's they're, they're the biggest of the biggest bands. Wow. Like, like, like biggest than any it, other artist. You would have a hard time finding a bigger artist in Brazil than Sepultura. Okay. That's Got internationally it. known. And, and it was shocking to me because, again, no internet. It was just from my own perception of from friends telling me, like, oh, check out the Sepultura yeah, yeah. tape, you know? And I was like, eh, Yeah, it's hard big. to fathom it. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't fathom it. Was no, there was no possible yeah. way, like, to understand it until actually being there. And that's when it was like, ooh, getting a little bit nervous, you know? Like, yeah. this is kind of weird where, like, everybody's coming out to, to, to get autographs because they didn't have cell phones to take photos yet. So... I went to the studio with them and they're like, okay, we're going to play a song. 
not an old song. We're going to play a song that we're writing. And then you just, the next time we play, you do some stuff over it. And here we go. One, <laughs> two, three. And I was like, oh my God, just like really felt bizarre. Mm -hmm. you know. And I, I, I don't know them either. And I've always played in bands with friends, right. people I grew up with, people I was close to. Mm -hmm. So it was really nerve wracking and it was really horrible. The first two days I was like, oh God. And I remember I would, went to the beach with the bass player and I was like, ah, oh, we're coming back. We're going to go back to the studio. But you should really just let yourself go. You know, you're here. You know, this is an opportunity that's really big and, and, and don't hold back, you know. And then and we got back and I was like, ah, oh, you guys like other bands like, um, I don't know, Bad Brains. are like, yeah, let's, let's jam this Bad Brains song. We're just like a cover of a song. And then we did that and I opened up a little bit. Do you remember which song, right, Hans? I do. It was Gene Machine. It was from the Quickness album. So I was like, oh, all right. I, I loosened up a little bit. And then we started doing the songs again. And then I started to flow with it, like kind of yeah. go with what I was hearing and doing a little bit of melodical stuff. And this was something they were looking for I didn't know. They wanted somebody that they could do stuff in the future with, not the same person. Try to do something where it's not only screaming, but have some melody that's in there or the option of doing something like that mm -hmm. you know so they wanted somebody with diversity and i wasn't trying to sing like the old singer and that's what's what they were looking for mm -hmm. yeah a lot of the tapes they were getting people were just trying to sound like the old singer i'm familiar with earlier sepultura mm -hmm. and i remember the first time i heard them was on like a headbangers ball or some right. mtv show Probably. and it was the first time i heard, in my in my naive ignorance the first time i'd heard that type of singing because mm. I had heard Pantera I had grown up with you know metal and mm -hmm. screaming it's the first time I heard the right right, right. and I was like what is that <laughs> like what's he doing so <laughs> I imagine happening? the poor guys in Sepultura receiving all these demo tapes of just like everyone around the world going oh yeah I, I'm, I'm sure like, which I'm is sure a great way to sing <laughs> there are other ways to, to sing metal. Well, absolutely. Well. I mean, it's grown tremendously. And I mean, back then, the label was definitely not keen on having me for numerous reasons. I'm going to go ahead and say it, but being black, not sounding like the old singer, not being famous, you know, they were looking for something like a fill in to jump right in and just continue doing what they had done in the past. Yeah. And that's exactly what the band is not about. Each yeah. album was always different. Mm -hmm. um, each album uh, had different producers. Everything was always different. And different they percussion, were, different approaches, absolutely. different everything. I mean, it's like really, I remember, because I was loosely paying attention to the Sepultura story. Mm -hmm. And I had assumed in my, again, ignorance, that it was sort of similar to other metal bands who kind of start doing one thing and stick with it. Yeah. Like there's a tradition in metal of like, yes. you do one thing in 1979, fast mm -hmm. forward 30 years, you're doing the exact same thing. Yeah. And Sepultura, I was like, oh, they kind of keep reinventing themselves. They keep right. That's so brave. It's so brave to say, I know you loved that. But we're trying something different. Right. Like, that's not But normal, in a natural way, yeah. because they were just getting, they were, for example, they were leaving their country. But it's great that it happened in a natural way. You know, mm -hmm. they were very young. They're stepping outside of Brazil for the first time, mm -hmm. playing places they never imagined, growing, learning a lot more. So that, of course, was going to adapt into the writing of the music. There was going to be an integral part of wanting to change because they had changed. Right. So... It got to the point of being away from Brazil for such a long time and missing elements of your home and the culture. That's when came about the album Roots. That was an album that was based on the roots of where they came from and using elements from Brazilian music that growing up were kind of like shunning, you know, like, ah, I don't want to have anything with that style of music or samba, that rhythm or anything. We want to stay away from that. We want to just do our own metal style. And so when they started, they had a lot of similarities to the bands that they admire, mm -hmm. you know, like Slayer and things like that. But then as time went on, each album, they start to develop their own personality. They start to learn to write in English because they would always write in Portuguese and have their friend translate it into English for them. But then that ended and they started writing their own and you could feel the changes, but it was happening in a very natural way and not forced, which made a big difference. So, and sort of bringing it back again to the vegan aspect mm -hmm. is so suddenly you're in one of the most successful metal bands in the world, the most successful band in Brazil. Mm -hmm. How did the people in the band respond? 
and especially how did their fans mm. respond to like here's the new singer mm. he's black mm. he's american <laughs> And he's a vegan. Like, I wonder how the metal community in Brazil responded. Mm. Well, Brazil was always the integral part of the band as far as being the main support uh, for all these years. There were always strong supporters of whatever the band was doing. Not everyone, but majority. You so know? they accepted, I mean... Yeah, because wow. I ended up living there and they were like, whoa, this guy is for real. He's really going to live here in Brazil. He's, you know, we want to see the band continue onward. They were, a lot of the people were always behind us, in Brazil especially. Um, outside of Brazil, in places like America, America was it was difficult because we didn't have the ability to play here as much as other bands because for us to play the US it involved getting a lot of visas mm -hmm. it cost a lot of money and and we had a stronger market in Europe and the, the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean that's all the times I've seen like there are actually a couple times I've been on the same bill as Sepultura. Right. But the times I've seen you guys was always in Europe. Right, right. And that was the market that we were really um, going after. So a lot of the times, uh, the people who, were, who weren't sure what was going on were in America. They were, weren't really up to date of what we had been doing. But we had been really touring so much and doing all these shows in incredible places. Places that a lot of bands and artists were never able to play, like Cuba, mm -hmm. um, India, um, Reunion Island, if you even know mm -hmm. where that is, it's like tiny. I've seen it on a map, but I don't remember where it is. Right, <laughs> and, close to Madagascar. <laughs> and what about the sort of the vegan animal rights oh, aspect right. okay. of it? So that element, surprisingly enough, people didn't really bother people that much at all. There's, I started to realize there are a lot of other people in the metal world that are plant based. Um, is it the guy? In Cannibal Court? No, no. Um, in Creator. Creator, that's right. Yeah. Millie, the Cause singer. Because I, I asked um, Alyssa mm -hmm. from Arch Enemy, I, I was like, so who else in the metal world? And she's like, wow, it's a surprising number of people <laughs> yeah. who are like, they look like the scariest people on the planet, but they're gentle animal rights activist vegans. Totally. It was surprising. I mean, even younger bands like Aborted and some other bands that we toured with, they're like, oh, we're vegan. I was like, well, this is awesome, you know? Yeah. And, and it makes a big difference, you know? I, I could, it was finally like, all right, there's some other people, like like-minded people and on the same boat and Sacred Reich, they have- uh, Literally on the same boat. Yeah. The metal cruise. <laughs> see, Lynn, see what I did right there? <laughs> That's a, that's a callback, people. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it wasn't that much of a, a big deal. I think for them, they were just like, like you said, they were used to bands not stepping outside of their box. Like, why don't you play it like this album or this album? But that changed. You know, I've been in the band so long. There's been so many years that we've been playing. Uh, we have a whole new generation of kids that have never seen the band before yeah. I got in. So. For them, they're like, oh, and they're already in their 30s. And they're just like, yeah, man, keep doing what you're doing. And it just, you know, it's been really incredible journey with them. I mean, it's just, I'm just surprised, very happily surprised that people accepted you as quickly and as well as they did. Mm -hmm. because I mean, yeah. it took some time. I mean, they were definitely like the cross-armed, like shows that I, we're doing, just like waiting, like, okay, all right, I can... Yeah, and then of course there's people like I will never accept this. This is not acceptable. Yeah. The band has to be the original of this and this, and you know that's fine. You know that's I never got into music to be like to please everybody. Yeah, you can't please everybody. Thing. Yeah, to go back, so you so you go in for this audition process, and then you're there for two weeks. How did they tell you that they wanted you to join? Mm -hmm. their band like what was that did they tell you at the end was of the like two reality? weeks or did, no, they, show, did they did they bring you out and they give you a rose yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish no there was like a lot of feijoada and <laughs> no it was just like okay well thanks and then so you go back yeah I go back to New York and I'm just like oh man I was like I really miss Brazil I really want to go back because before I was like I'm getting a free trip to Brazil. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, I might as well just go. And was this Sao Paulo? Or? Yeah, Sao okay. Paulo. And I, I was just like, man, I really miss being there. Mm -hmm. That whole vibe was great. It was really new and challenging. And and then about a month later, they called and they're like, hey, you want to come back to Brazil and work on this album? Because they had a lot of the songs written. And I, I, I just was like, oh, my God. Like, I can't believe it. Like, 
yeah, <laughs> I definitely mm-hmm. want to go. You know, like, yeah, the first show is going to be like a free show where you bring food and you get in. We're going to invite a bunch of guests like Jason Newstead from Metallica, Mike Patton from Faith No More. We're going to have like the Shavanti Indians come from the Amazon and perform. Damn. It's going to be like 30,000 people. So we'll see you in Brazil. And I was just like, what? You're like, no pressure. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then it was like, and then it really was like, oh my God, this is insane what's happening. But it just happened so fast. Yeah. You know, the recording process of going there, not only recording in Brazil, but in LA and Sado Island with Kodo drummers. Like, we were just like really out there with like the ideas hmm. of this album that we we're going to do, introducing this new singer, the new band, you know, like a whole new sound. And we just went off. We're like, let's do this. Like, to show everybody and uh, and just go against what people might think. That's so cool. Here's another very important question to me personally, because I think about it all the time mm-hmm. when I listen to metal. Okay. And even some <laughs> punk, but mostly metal, which is how do you take care of your voice and not get nodes and not mm-hmm. just like, like, mm-hmm. how do you do that? I mean, is it just technique or is there other things that you're doing to take care of yourself? I, I assume it helps being a giant human being. Well, having a well, very deep to voice be fair, naturally. I'm a very small human being. <laughs> so like, like almost everybody's pretty big compared to me, but like Derek is a, a large, like clearly like more physically evolved specimen. But yeah, it's a great sure, question. I'm, I'm just, I'm just rambling people on. That, I mean, that people right. that, do not have your size. Mm-hmm. So there has to be, I mean, obviously there's incredible technique involved, right. but I just want to know more about that because I know musical theater people that, you know, have to belt eight shows a week and they all get these terrible yeah. nodes and then they have to take time off and yeah. go on vocal. Like mm-hmm. it's a whole thing. So I'm just wondering what that, what that's like for you. At the very beginning, the guy suggested that I see a vocal coach here in LA. Um, but uh, he was fantastic. He worked with James Hetfield from Metallica, Bjork, Janet Jackson. He worked with everyone. He would James Hetfield, Bjork, and Janet Jackson. Like that seems like the beginning like of a very bad basement. joke. Like so, James Hetfield, Bjork, and Janet Jackson walk, walk into a bar. Into a bar. <laughs> Peanut said, "I'm assaulted." Um. <laughs> but it, it definitely helped. It was it, it. You have to do these vocal exercises before and after the show. Do's and don'ts. He taught me, you know, about like you shouldn't drink alcohol ever yeah. before a show. And if you can after, definitely not. It will shrink your vocal cords. No smoke whatsoever being around that. No loud talking or talking in general after show um, as much as possible. Keep it to a minimum. Um, and just health wise, you know, eat well. Stay away from uh, acidic type foods, mm-hmm. and tomato sauce and things like that. Um, don't use this honey or anything like that. Don't use any of these sprays that numb your voice because you won't know when mm-hmm. you do have a problem. Whoa. And you'll become addicted to it if you don't have it. So all these tips that I got and practice definitely help. And, you know, fortunately, I never had to cancel a show out of the 20 over 25 years of doing it i'm sure you've seen that happen to other like absolutely yeah but i've seen them also not take care of their voices and and for me it's very serious i always have this reoccurring dream where i'm screaming and nothing is coming out so scary. And it's like a terrifying feeling and i never want that for a show but i usually just try to take it easy on tour and not overdo anything and just mm-hmm. as far as after a show and before a show and just take that very seriously is there a technique to like how you make the sound that's well, safer than yeah, just like yelling? Yeah, it's not using your throat. It's yeah. really pushing that air and having a very strong diaphragm and pushing that air and using the roof of your mouth to blow and mm-hmm. create the sounds by opening your mouth wider or, mm-hmm. or, or closer, hmm. um, creating like higher, lower tones. Mm-hmm. But just getting comfortable and relaxing your vocal cords mm-hmm. in your throat and not using it so much as like... Uh, you know, yeah, to try to like push it right. out. You just you really need to relax that. And being around good producers that can hear when you start doing that yeah. in the studio, they're like, don't do that. Like loosen it up, wow. just belt it out, but just use that. It has force. to come from the right spot. Right. When did you finally sort of bite the bullet? Did you? Go to, like my route shared by almost everybody is like the vegetarian yeah. leading to vegan route. Yeah. How did that happen? It happened because I think after a while people were just like, you just might as well go vegan. You know, it's like you're a vegetarian for so long. Just do it. It doesn't make any sense. And then I started to learn more about 
the whole dairy process mm -hmm. and everything. It was just learning out the treatment of animals and to your body and to the planet. Mm -hmm. All these things start to come out, all this information. And when was this? <sighs> For me, I started really thinking about it like seven years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that information was something that I just never had before. I wasn't really paying too much attention to that. But uh, it, it started to come across, you know, uh, seeing a lot of the statistics and everything that was happening in mm -hmm. that whole world. I was like, oh, my God, this is just as damaging, you know, as the meat industry. And then it was easy to really stop. I'm, it was much easier than I imagined, actually. It's an, I mean, it's an easier step once you've already learned how to live in a world without meat. Right. You already know the places to get all mm -hmm. the things. Well, I also was radically opposed to giving money to these companies. I yeah. was just like, I don't want to support these companies. These companies could care less about me or the planet or the animals. And, mm -hmm. and this was something that was disturbing to like support mm -hmm. these companies. It's, I mean, people don't realize how much power they have in their money yep. and they're buying uh, whatever they're consuming. You collectively get a group of people. You can really change things radically. So you have a lot of people that demand and meatless products, then that will come about. And I've seen it happen where we've done like metal cruise ship and yeah. we're going out and, and then I was like, oh boy, I'm going to starve on this. I know it's only going to be like meat and whatever. And, and they had a full vegan area like set up just like everything else, starting with appetizer, the meal, dessert, all vegan. And, and I was shocked. I was like, how did this come about? And they're like, oh, enough. A lot of people were really complaining about it, like there's wow. not being enough options. And, and so we decided to really step it up. I mean, first of all, it's kind of amazing. There is such a thing as a metal cruise. <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a few and of them. <laughs> secondly, I really want to, the idea of going on a metal cruise seems there's awesome. a, There's definitely an appeal. So as, oh, no, as no, a it's, fan, it's who are some of the bands okay, this is a good question. that you've seen on a metal cruise? And I want to just say like how amazing it is that there's a metal cruise, but then there's vegan food. <laughs> <laughs> on a metal crew, like everything about oh, yeah. that seems a like vegan buffet. Like, they, like basically, I'm hallucinating. Like I've taken too much mescaline. And I'm <laughs> right. in the desert. And this is a hallucination. And a packed and not, line, yeah. mind you, where I was almost getting angry. Like, all right, enough the vegans already. Get out of the line. Yeah, yeah. For the vegan buffet that. on the metal crew. So, yeah. who are some of the other bands okay. on a metal cruise? Um, Kiss. They have their own cruise. Bands like Cannibal Corpse, mm -hmm. uh, this band Sabaton. Uh, I saw this band Voivod from Canada. Yeah. They were fantastic because I got to sit in the theater, like in the back, just kind of sit and watch the host set from the beginning to the end. And I love that feeling of just being able to to watch a show like that uh, without being harassed by like people like, what's up? What's going on? Yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that happened a lot, especially in Brazil. It's impossible to see a show. But on the cruise, people are very respectable. The The people who mm -hmm. are attending the cruise, they understand that you're trapped on the boat, so they're not, like, harassing you. Yeah. And, it's and also, like, it's probably, really it's probably like it, because I used to own a restaurant in New York, and so it was, like, the height of my weird fame. And you could tell, like, the first day people would come in and be like, hey, there's Moby. Right. And by day six, they're like, who cares? Right. Like, there's the bald guy again. Yeah. No yeah. big deal. So imagine <laughs> if you're on a cruise with someone. Yeah. Like, the first day, they're probably like, that's Derek from True. Sepultura. By day three, it's like, I wish he'd get out of the line. Like, yeah. I want to get the fried <laughs> No, no, totally. Yeah. It's like, yeah. uh, could you step aside, please? Yeah. No, it's exactly that way. And, and, and they have a lot of respect. And people are waiting all year to do the cruise. And they meet their friends. And it becomes like a reunion for a lot of the people on the cruise. And everyone's in great spirits, especially people working there. They're like, oh, this is the best crowd that comes on the cruise. Whenever we have like electronic music, it's the worst. And I was like, whoa, why? And they're like, oh, because they're just doing a lot of drugs, destroying the place, just like staying up like all night. It's a mess. But the metal cruise, a lot of people are very respectful to the people working there. And those people working there love rock and metal. Mm -hmm. So they're just very excited to see some of the bands that they admire and enjoy. That's so hmm. funny. It's the funny. difference between the two. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so I, we have some. I have some very basic vegan questions. All right. Okay, because you are a road warrior touring musician. Correct. So the, the most basic <laughs> question I have is, where have you found to be the easiest to be a vegan? Where's the hardest? And where is the most surprising? By way of example, mm. the best vegan food I had on my last tour, Gdańsk, Poland. 
Wow, that's I funny that you com- say that. Completely surprised. Beautiful place right I was on like, the water. I was like, Gdansk? Like, Gdansk. amazing. Some of the best vegan food I've ever had. It's been some very surprising places. So, again, I'm answering my own question mm-hmm. because I'm a narcissist, so I'm going to stop talking. And- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because on this last tour, Poland was definitely one of the top three amazing plant-based meals that we had on tour at the venue. Mm-hmm. And this woman created all these dishes from lunch to dinner, all phenomenal, like mind-blowing. Even the dressing room was set up with everything from candy to snacks, all plant-based. But one of the top, I think, from this past tour was Berlin. They went over the top. This chef just did his homework. He knew that we are coming from South America, so he made sure to have a lot of different dishes from South America or that idea. Like one of my favorite ve- that we tried to make at Little Pine, but it just didn't quite work, was feijoada. Ah, uh, feijoada. There's two things about it. Wow. One, I had vegan feijoada the last time I was in Brazil, and it was so good. The other reason I bring it up, it's just such a fun word to say. Yes, say feijoada. It, feijoada. Ooh. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Like, don't you want to go to a restaurant and say, like, oh, I'll have the feijoada? Like, I don't even know what feijoada means, except that it's like some black beans thing. Black beans. Yeah, um, it's but, delicious. That's a staple meal in Brazil. It's everywhere, every Wednesday. Yeah. So, Lynn, don't you want to try Fishwada, I fish really water. do. I'm dying to try yeah, it. Yeah, the first time I tried, I already saw it. I was like, "Oh, fish water. And They're like, "Yes, there's no meat in there." And I was like, mm, "That looks like a pig ear floating in there." And they're like, "Oh, that's for flavor." No! <laughs> I was just like, "Oh, all right." You're like, "That's very <laughs> clearly an ear, ma'am." Yeah. I was like, "No, we we'll just scoop it out to the side." And I was no. like, oh. yeah. "Well, we can bring you a bowl with less ears." <laughs> yeah, less ears, less. <laughs> less... Um, Oops. Okay, so so Berlin. Okay. And, um, and I would Poland. say the most surprising was uh, Russia, uh, just because I was lucky when I went there because it was Lent. Mm-hmm. Uh, every place that we were staying at that time, all plant-based menus, incredible food. And I was like, man, they should do this more often. I mean, they had great ideas that they were doing. So that was definitely sticks out of one of the best places that I've had vegan food that was surprisingly mm-hmm. uh, plant-based I don't know. L.A. is pretty good. I mean, it's I mean, definitely I mean, I like to remind world. people, because I've been doing a lot of interviews around the movie, and there's that old question of like, so how are things different now than they were in 1987? Because that's mm, when I went vegan. Yeah. And I'm like, well, to put it in perspective, there are more vegan restaurants in a two-mile radius of where we are sitting right now mm-hmm. than there were in the entire world in 1987. Wow. But I got to say that Sao Paulo... I mean, Brazil itself is a big meat-eating country, and mm-hmm. and it's known for its churrascaria. It's like a barbecue place, mm-hmm. and it's changed. Oh, that is that where they bring out meats yeah, on so swords? On spits, yes, and there's they, lots of swords and meat. A lot of in swords. That. And meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you got the sauces and things like that. Yeah, there. yeah. Um, it changed radically. Where that it has one of my favorite restaurants. Um, two of my favorite places are there in Sao Paulo where they just really stepped it up. It's impressive. Being with like-minded musicians who are plant-based, um, we developed an idea of coming up with a TV show called Highway to Health. Mm-hmm. Myself and Tanya O'Callaghan, who's from Ireland, and she's a traveling musician, activist, bass player, extraordinaire, and we do a show An together. An all-around delightful person. All delightful. Very delightful. <laughs> I Very delightful there. Oh. There's my Irish accent for her. Isn't it? What's it called again? Uh, pirate. Pirate. Uh, pirate uh, Piratish. Pirate. Pirate. <laughs> Piratish? Yeah, because well, it's like, like a pirate J- Jamaican accent. pirate. Oh Jamaican Irish pirate. Leprechaun. <laughs> leprechaun pirate, yeah. <laughs> leprechaun pirate. Well, Jamaican mm-hmm. leprechaun pirate. I think we just come up with a great new Netflix cartoon <laughs> idea. The leprechaun pirates. <laughs> I'd watch it. Okay, so, so Highway to Health. Highway to Health. I was watching during the pandemic, or even before, actually, way before, I was watching a lot of these travel shows where they're going to exotic places mm-hmm. and eating incredible food, like crazy food that most people would never buy or afford and I don't know why they would be eating in the first place because it's some type of very unique animal yeah um and it was frustrating because I'd never seen a show where they were going to places having healthy food or um 
something reasonable where an, an average person can go and eat and enjoy something. So the whole idea, we, we both had this concept of traveling to places unknown or known that we've traveled to, having conversations with food involved, plant-based food, um, and that whole world, not only health-wise in plant-based world, but also mental health, physical health, and hitting all those topics and, 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 and doing interviews with people who are from different walks of life and having people that aren't necessarily vegan on, but also have other people that are disciplined in, in the mind or mm -hmm. in some other ways, you know. And, and again, this show is geared towards people who are not vegan. So they can kind of answer those questions they might have and to break all the stereotypes that exist around it. That's really cool. And, it, and Highway to Health is debuting in March. In March. It will be debuting in March on our YouTube channel. Uh, and I can go and subscribe on your YouTube channel That's now. right. Go and subscribe. <laughs> And it, it's going to be fantastic. We have yourself on there. Just Moby's F on it. Just Moby's FYI, on it. Yeah, he was pointing at me. Yes, Moby's yeah, on it. I know that podcasts are not necessarily a visual <laughs> bagel. medium. Um, but yeah. Bagel is not on the... Bagel, bagel is not. No, bagel is not on it, though. She Future really knows episodes. how to live. You yeah. Know? But we have a lot of uh, incredible guests. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of laughs. We We go all over the world you know we're on a kiss cruise with tanya and steven adler so steven fun. adler's in another episode with toby morris yeah I had um, a, a, and then steven was one of the original guns and roses members and uh, i remember one time when crossroads first opened there were all these rock <laughs> legends like geezer was there from yes, Ge he's geezer, a hardcore credit vegan. to Geezer from Black Sabbath. Geezer I think he was that. vegan before anyone, maybe apart from your uncle. I love that. And Dick Gregory. But like Geezer's <laughs> been vegan, I think, from the early 70s. That's so great. And you tell people like, wow, yeah, the, the songwriter from Black Sabbath has is the original vegan. I love that. Um, OG vegan. But yeah, I was at, at Crossroads and like Geezer was there. Dave Grohl was there. Paul McCartney was there. I mean, granted, wow. Paul McCartney, I wouldn't call him in like a, well, he wrote. Helter Skelter, uh, and Steven Adler was there, and like all these rock guys were at a vegan restaurant, and I was like, "How did this happen? Like, this is so." People in terms of making it that. cool, that was pretty cool. That's it's pretty very, cool. Very, very cool, and that's another thing with the show. It definitely show very cool people, very interesting people, who are cool, who are also plant based. So, Love that. I think it helps a lot. So Derek, thank you for giving up so much of your time and oh, coming over and having lunch and meeting Lynn. Well, you met Lindsay before, but meeting Bagel. I, um, I met I Bagel, Bagel before too. I met Bagel before to some other dinners. The, there's that Caribbean <laughs> Irish pirate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's back again. Yeah. <laughs> now this is more of a pirate one. <laughs> um, and thank you for being such a smart, oh. thoughtful, outspoken plant-based activist like to, to Lindsay's questions like how do we make veganism cooler like be more like Derek oh yeah. man thank be more you Derek so much guys so, yeah minus maybe, maybe maybe minus, minus the Jamaican your, Irish yes yeah. minus that <laughs> everything else yes so thank, thank you, you so much for absolutely um, coming over I'm granted now that I realize you live pretty close, I'm yeah, going to have yeah. to have you come up. Well, we should meet up more often. I assumed you live far sure. away. Oh, I no. I'm on an e-bike right away. Yeah, yeah Derek showed up on the <laughs> coolest looking e-bike I've ever seen. I'm and has been lie. charging the battery That's for the it as we literally That's the fanciest, coolest e-bike I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Anyway, thank you so much All for right, doing guys. this, Derek. Thank you. You the best. Well, that was freaking delightful. Uh, Derek Green, thanks again. Um, I just want to take a minute and say thank you to you, the listener, for listening. It's a really cool thing you're doing. Please don't forget to send us questions or comments or feedback or dog pictures to mobypod at moby.com. Um, we love the questions and the stuff that's coming in so please keep it coming we'd love to be responsive and chat with you back so keep that in mind um and also while we're at it if you want to go and share the podcast or even just rate it review it on your favorite podcasting app that would mean the whole dang world to me and moby and also bagel but now moby are, are you do you want to talk about some some stuff 
Well, yeah, I mean, the theme of today's episode three Moby Pod is the punk rock vegan movie and also punk rock and animal rights and vegan activism. Because the whole reason we made the movie was to both talk about the history of punk rock and animal rights, but also to try and use creativity, to try and mm -hmm. use our odd little production company, Little Walnut, to look at animal rights and look at veganism in hopefully what's a, a, a kind of unique, if not idiosyncratic way. So, Moby, I, I produced this film with you. And there's a question that I've never asked because before we began, I came on to start working on this movie with you. You'd been recording the interviews for some time, but I've never really asked you, like, what was the spark, the impetus for you to decide that this was the movie you wanted to make? Where did that come from? And what was that very first like step in conversation like? Okay, so I was at this event, uh, the fundraiser for Mercy for Animals, and I was talking to a bunch of fellow animal rights activists. And somehow the conversation turned to the history of animal rights. And I was talking about the early days of punk rock animal rights activism, you know, with Crass and Youth of Today and Bad Brains and the people I was with who all had tattoos and were committed animal rights activists didn't know that a huge part of the animal rights movement evolved and originated in the punk rock scene. Um, because there's this assumption on the part of a lot of people that punk rock is nihilism, that punk rock is just destruction for the sake of destruction. And I guess presumptuously, not even presumptuously, but just based on evidence and based on growing up in the punk rock world, I know that hardcore, especially American hardcore, is so principled. You know, and I can see someone goes to a, a hardcore show and you see people stage diving. The singer is screaming at the top of their lungs and you can make the assumption that it's chaos, but it isn't. It's so principled because there is that core ethos. The central ideology of punk rock is questioning. You know, you look at everything in the world and you question it. You question the fashion, you question the music, but you also question food. And that's what led so many of the original punk rockers and even hardcore punk rockers today to become vegans and animal rights activists. So that, Lindsay, that's my long-winded way of answering your question. It was basically being surprised that a lot of people were not aware of the history of punk rock and animal rights and wanting to shine a light on that and remind people of just how important that punk rock ethos of questioning and replacing the things in the world that don't conform to our values. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I was very unfamiliar with that world. And to me, looking in, I always saw it as something that was aggressive. I don't know if you remember this, Moby, but we went to that Bad Brains show. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. I, I played with Bad Brains. At Shepherd Fairy Studio. Yeah. And it was so cool. And you played with them. And I remember before we went, you were like learning the to play bass for the for these guitar, songs. But oh, yeah. Oh, was it guitar? Similar to bass, just a couple more strings. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I'm not a musician. Um, <laughs> You said it was really, really hard. You said it was one of the harder things you've had to learn. And I was really impressed by that because I think of you as kind of this musician that can do pretty much everything. But to see you be challenged by the music was so unbelievable. And I was like, okay, wow, they're doing something really cool. But I didn't really know what to expect because I wasn't super familiar with the Bad Brains other than like, you know, from a very outsider perspective. But then we went... And I don't know, remember if it was them playing or somebody opening for them, but the crowd was so aggressive. And I'd seen a mosh pit before, but there was something really next level about this. There were people climbing the walls and then jumping down into the crowd. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. And I fully understand how anyone standing outside of that can just see violence and chaos. And I guess that is the sort of fascinating juxtaposition or paradox within the hardcore punk world is it's so aggressive and looks so loud and potentially violent, but it's so ethical. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's lots of punk rock that's not principled. I mean, especially, <laughs> you know, when punk rock became popular in the 90s, you know, with bands like Rancid and Green Day, and I really like Rancid and Green Day, but like as it became more popular, 
it became more like Woodstock 99. Like there was a lot of punk rock that was really just meathead frat boys who wanted to punch each other in the face. Mm -hmm. But separate from that, separate from the meathead idiots was this spirit of intelligence and questioning. And that's what I grew up with. And yeah, that was the goal of the movie is to really look at that. And even more so to try and remind people that that ethos of questioning and the ethos of taking ownership of the institutions in our lives and not supporting institutions that don't conform to our values, like it, it seems like a lot of us have forgotten that. A lot of us have just gone along and are involved in a culture that we don't respect. And we're involved in a culture that doesn't reflect our values. And what was great about growing up in the world of punk rock is it basically said, if you don't like this culture, you reject it. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you try and figure out the algorithms so the culture might throw you a breadcrumb or two. Like just that idea of you reject what does not conform to your ethics. And I hope that the people who watch punk rock vegan movie maybe come away with a reminder of that, that like you can have principles and sometimes principles can be lonely. Sometimes principles can be very isolating as probably every animal rights activist on the planet will tell you. But at least for me, and I can only speak for myself, like my adherence to my values and my principle, that's more important to me than accommodating such a compromised culture. Mm -hmm. It's important because and what strikes me about it is that it's very easy to survive in this world, never questioning anything. You can go to a grocery store and get whatever, and you don't really have to think about it too hard. You just give them, give someone money and you take the thing home, you know? But I think something that's really beautiful about punk rock is that it says, look harder. Like, it's a kind of loud, chaotic meditation on the state of our world and how we want it to be, which is really cool. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, it thrills me to hear you say that. And you also hit on an incredibly important point. You know, we live in a world where people feel like so much is out of their control, that they don't have agency. But the truth is, every time we spend money, we're supporting a company, we're supporting mm -hmm. a product, we're supporting a supply chain. Mm -hmm. And I think people sometimes forget about that. And they also forget how incredibly responsive corporations can be if you make it clear to them that you do not approve of what they're doing. If enough people tell a corporation they don't like what the corporation is doing, the corporation will change. What's a fascinating thing that's happened over the last few years is every car company in the world is now transitioning to electric cars. Mm -hmm. That was unheard. Of. I mean, it's inconceivable. And I mean, Burger King, McDonald's, they're all trying to go a little more plant-based because they're responding to consumers. So of course, people need to vote. They need to protest. They need to express themselves and be activists in any way they can. But the easiest form of activism is just choosing what you spend money on. And if a company is doing something you don't like, let them know. And I promise you they'll pay attention. Yeah, that's really, really true. I mean, they're all on a growth model. They all have to grow. And if the old way isn't working, they're very motivated to change. But are we, <laughs> you know? People have to also be motivated to change, and it's hard. I think that looking at your world and trying to keep an open mind on the way that things have always been, it's not easy to do. It's not like we're saying that the punk rock ethos is, a, is, a, is an easy thing to take on, but I think it's an important, a, an important ideology. Yeah, I mean, it helps if you're like me and you're pretty comfortable being isolated and almost taking solace and comfort in the loneliness that comes with that. I understand other people might not be such isolated <laughs> misanthropes as me. So it's that question of like, do what you can when you can, but also with whatever resources you have and with the understanding that everybody's different. You know, there's no such thing as one size fits all activism. Okay, so yeah, I feel like we I've been we, yeah, is it a tangent? A, maybe it's a, a tangent. Bit too much about this issue, but I will say Lindsay, yeah, and Bagel. Mhm. Mm thank you guys for helping me to make this movie because, you know, going out and interviewing people it was actually kind of the fun easy part. The stuff we've been doing for the last few months of like all the the business stuff. Oh, speaking of business stuff, 
we should mention the fact that we're giving the movie away. Like one of our goals is that no one any no one anywhere should ever pay for the punk rock vegan movie. It's free. And if you're paying for it, you shouldn't because we want it to be available for free for every person on the planet. Yeah, it's on YouTube. You can download it. You can watch it for free. So if somebody's asking you for money for it, uh, don't. Unless it's some organization that you really like. In which case, sure, give them your money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that free ethos, I mean, is so important. We don't want to have any barriers for anyone anywhere being able to watch this movie. And maybe that sounds presumptuous, but the ultimate goal is an activist goal. I mean, I like one of my only goals in life is to move the needle away from the current system. Mm -hmm. You know, this system that kills a trillion animals every year. And seeing as we have limited resources, we try and use whatever limited resources we have to achieve that. And obviously making the punk rock vegan movie is, uh, we'll see, but hopefully a reasonably effective expression of that. So, Moby. Yes. Something that I think is really cool is that when we were making punk rock vegan movie, we would occasionally be like, hey, we need a piece of music that will fit into this transition. And you would go into your house for about 15 minutes and come out with the most incredible track I've ever heard ever that you just put together because you are a music genius. So one of the things that you also put together for a punk rock vegan movie is a punk rock version of a song that you had done before called Beautiful. And I was asking you the other day, how did you make a punk rock version? Like you just have a, an innate knowledge of all of the elements that go into it. And I thought that maybe you would walk us through your punk rock version of Beautiful. I would be happy to. But going back many, many, many years. So the original version of Beautiful is one of my least favorite songs of anything I've ever done. Oh, no. Why? Well, I mean, it's perfectly fine, but it's a lighthearted little pop song. And it's just, by the way, I don't know if anyone can listen very critically, but in the background, you can hear Bagel whimpering just a little bit because Lindsay is in a different room and I'm in my main studio and Bagel is trying to get in and I really want to go let her in. I think you got to let her in. She's, she's desperate. Come on, Bagel. I know it's not a visual medium, but Bagel is now sitting on my lap. Hi, Bagel. Oh, hello. Okay, so getting back to the song Beautiful, the original version, it's not my favorite, which I've said in a few different quasi-diplomatic ways, so I'm going to stop repeating myself. Do you think that when you wrote the lyrics, you went too vulnerable and it makes you feel uncomfortable because of the <laughs> vulnerability you displayed when writing it? I think it might. I love that question. I think it might be the exact opposite, is that it's kind of a song about celebrities. It's just, it's sort of vapid. So it's whatever the opposite of vulnerable is, that's kind of what the song is for me. I see. Okay, so this new version, we were working on the closing credits for Punk Rock Vegan Movie, which for anyone listening who hasn't seen the movie, the credits have lots of little cutaways to me and Bagel workshopping the title of the movie. And for these little workshopping segments, I wore my best film director outfit. So I'm wearing a black turtleneck and dark glasses, looking a little bit like I should be the CFO of a Silicon Valley startup or someone selling like fireworks in Eastern Europe. <laughs> but in any case, there are these adorable little sides of Bagel helping me figure out the title of the movie and we needed music for this section and i don't know why i thought this was a chance to redeem this song beautiful and so to your point earlier i went into my studio while you and mike were editing this section together and i very quickly threw together this punk rock version of beautiful and i didn't expect much and sorry if this is self-serving, it actually came together so much better than I thought it was going to. And I actually ended up really liking this punk rock version way more than the original. Like the original, as I said, is kind of banal. And this one is just, I mean, this is ridiculous, but 
I thought it ended up being really fun. Do you want to uh, talk about the different elements in the song and sort of break it down a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to hear them because if I'm honest, you know, when I am listening to music because I am not a musician myself, I just hear a bunch of sounds. And sometimes <laughs> it just sounds like one sound, one sound and people saying nice words over it. Uh-huh. So. I, I guess help me be a less of a music dum dum, and to hear the individual parts that you put together, so I can appreciate. Well, these you certainly better. are not a music dum dum, but uh, nonetheless, let's um let's break down all the different elements within the song, okay? Okay, but also, okay, I'd love it if you could, when you're telling me about them, what makes them classically punk rock? You know what I mean? Like uh-huh. why you chose them for this version? Okay. Fun. I can do that. Okay, great. (laughs) Okay, so the original Beautiful was 95 beats per minute. And this punk rock version is twice as fast. So I thought we'd start with the drums. So as you can hear, those are the drums. And what I love to do for these sort of either punk rock or rock songs is combine live elements with programmed elements. Okay. So here's the, the, the kick drum. What I mean is this is the, so the kick drum is actually being generated by the computer. But then when I factor in some of the live elements, to me it sounds like it's, it, it's twice as fast as the original and a lot more energetic. And what punk rock song would be complete without the guitars? So here are the guitars, which... That's not a computer. No, no, that's, that's, that's me playing guitar. And then you add in the bass. Is that, is that real? That's, okay, so there's an interesting little story here, and I'm going to turn these guys down just a little bit. At least I think it's an interesting story. Uh, Years and years and years and years and years and years ago, I did some production and remix for Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson. Wow. Um, And mainly because I just was super curious to see how Quincy Jones worked i mean it's quincy jones like it was i so it was on thriller and um wait was what was on thriller the work i did you worked on the song thriller well the remixes no it was actually beat it you worked on the remix for beat it yeah holy moly. I, I, got, I got some history so <laughs> um <laughs> okay so the main reason i did it was because i really wanted to see how Quincy Jones worked. And Mm -hmm. one of the things he taught me inadvertently was to combine live bass with synth bass. And so that's what we have here. So that's half live, half synth? Half live, half synth. And you end up with like the aggression of both. And normally you wouldn't have live and synth bass on a punk rock song, but I thought once you factor in the guitar, live drums, program drums, you end up with this really sort of cool sounding combination of like traditional punk elements with some sort of almost like industrial elements underneath them. It does sound industrial. Yep, and then it stops. Oh. So let me, while we're, I'm just going to move this vocal section up. Some of the non-vocal parts down. Love you, baby. And there's me. Love you now. Ooh. Look at us, what beautiful. So, All the people for shampoo, another thing I learned in doing the remixes and production for other people is I learned the the power of sort of what's called stacking vocals. Yeah. So so that's just me, but there are actually 10 of me in there. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is it the same take that you're stacking or is it 10 different takes that you're stacking? 
It's the same part of the song. So if it's it's if it's the verse, it starts off with one lead vocal. And then what I will sometimes do is add doubles, triples, quadruples. Uh, sometimes, like on, I made this album, or I made two albums called The Void Pacific Choir. And on some of those tracks, there are up to 50 or 60 vocals. And the way I learned to do that is I read an interview with the guy who produced Queen and the Cars, and he was talking about how he would just stack and stack and stack, and you end up with these choirs, and it just creates this huge sense of space. And speaking of choirs, so at the very end, I decided to add myself as a choir because nothing says punk rock like a choir. So you want to hear me as a choir? More than anything. Okay, so here's me as a completely ridiculous, overly dramatic choir. Isn't that ridiculous? And then we add in that live bass and synth bass. And then we bring in all the other instruments for chaos and drama. That's pretty ridiculous, huh? I love it. So, what are you saying? We are all so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Look at us, we're beautiful. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so that is the quick, weird, punk rock version of Beautiful that plays over the end credits of the punk rock vegan movie. Hopefully that was interesting, and, and, and I, I'm really glad that Bagel was here to just sort of like run around and yell in the background. It made her really excited. Really, really excited. Okay, so we've gotten a lot of really amazing questions from people that have emailed mobypod at moby.com. Um, Wait, Linz, what's that email address again? Well, I'll tell you. It's mobypod at moby.com. And people are emailing us a bunch of amazing things, and I've been emailing back with people and talking to them, and it's been really, really fun. Um, but one of the questions I got from Michelle, who also goes by Rebel Wheels, which is cool. Um, ask this question. Are you prepared to hear a question? I am prepared. Okay, great. Well, okay. I mean, I, I don't know what the question is, so I hope I'm prepared. <laughs> I just mean, are you in a place of relaxed readiness? I mean, insofar as I'm capable of ever being in a place of relaxed readiness, I mean, considering I'm like basically anxious from the time I wake up until the time I go to sleep, but <laughs> given that, yeah, like relatively, relative to my normal state of like teeth gnashing anxiety, I'm fairly relaxed. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Okay, here's the question. As a creative person, I feel like artists are vessels in which ideas come to us slash through us, but it's much bigger than us as individuals. The two of you are creative people. So I would be curious if you feel creativity is a spiritual slash cosmic thing or how you view the process of inspiration. Wow. What a wonderful question. I thought so too. I actually have a thought. What's that? At some point, because I feel like a question like that deserves a really like kind of thoughtful, long response. Mm -hmm. So maybe at some point, Linz, if mm -hmm. you're up for it, maybe we do an entire MobyPod episode about that question. I think that's an amazing idea. About creativity. Because the truth is, I, I mean, I don't know what your perspective is, but from my perspective, creativity is, I mean, it, it can potentially encapsulate everything. Like it can be a refuge. It can be a form of protest and activism. It can help us connect with other people. It can help us connect with ourselves and the world around us. I mean, the world is so baffling. Obviously, the human world is baffling, but the world beyond that 
is so baffling. And I feel like creativity is sort of like a way of finding refuge within that baffling world, but also channeling some elements of it and sort of representing the human condition within that sort of incredibly baffling context. What do you think? Well, yeah, I think that digging into it more and hearing from other people, we had a really interesting conversation with our friend Robert Russell about creativity and finding a way to keep creativity spiritual while living in, you know, late stage capitalism and what that looks like and how do you maintain creativity as a spiritual practice. It's a really, really huge question. And I think that like a little bit, our humanity lies in it. Yeah, without question. Well, no pun intended. So thank you, (laughs) Michelle. And at some point, hopefully over the next few weeks, we will create an entire episode just simply based on that question. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening to this third episode of Moby Pod, and I hope you get the chance to watch the punk rock vegan movie, and I hope you don't pay for it because you shouldn't, because it's available, as we keep saying, it's available for free wherever free movies might be found. Exactly. I also want to say a massive thank you to our guest, Derek Green, for coming and having lunch with us and talking to us for a really long time. It was amazing to have you, Derek, and I hope to have you back again sometime soon. Um, Our editor is Jonathan Nesvadba, and we want to send a big thanks to Human Content for helping get this podcast into your listening device. Thank you so much for listening to MobiPod. 